anyway, today we have Derek Kimball of Kimball Hardwoods here with us. Um, I'll just let him take the floor, let him kind of tell us what he does. So how'd you get into the wood business? Um, kind of take us through how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Hey, hey Connor. Thanks for having me. Yes. Yeah, so wood goes pretty deep in the family roots uh, started. My great uncle Eddie, oh God, back in the 40s, I think it was. And so on my dad's side, we're all Italian immigrants and we all came over from uh, Italy at uh, Ellis Island, turn of the century. And the, the entire family, every single one of them were stonemasons. But my uncle Eddie decided to part ways with the family biz. And um, that started it all. He was, you know, a struggling carpenter because back then, it, you know, they never had any of the resources that we have at this day and age. But anyways, um, before he passed, he passed on uh, his knowledge and his hand tools to my father, who to this day is a 40 year high end Finnish uh, carpenter, very, very skilled. Uh, matter of fact, a breed of which is it's shrinking and we don't see, um, I find that there aren't as many up and coming carpenters that that either have those skills or want to have those skills. So anyways, I learned most of what I know from my father. I grew up in a shop on a job site. Um, and then, you know, I started cutting trees years ago as a very dangerous stress relief pastime that kind of morphed into something more. And, you know, as a pretty avid guitar player for many, many years, I had actually for, spent quite a bit of time, 20 years in the food industry, believe it or not. But it wasn't until about four years ago. Um, had some, you know, some circumstances that took place in my family that I just wasn't happy with. I was very successful in food service. So we, I had money. Um, and I just, you know, I, I wanted to get back to playing guitar. And, and I started thinking about it. I said, you know, it's time after 24 years of doing this. I'm grateful for the opportunity. But I, I want to do what I love. And, uh, I never, I was always around wood. I never stopped doing that. I never stopped doing, but it was time to turn it into a business. And, um, and that's what I did. My, my wife had lost her job. One of my family members got sick, you know, being in sales, the pressure was on and it was just, you know, unobtainable numbers. And it was just like, you know, it was, it was that time in life where things just sucked. And, um, I, remember the night I made the decision. I was literally sitting on the couch, dreading going to a sales meeting the next morning, thinking I've got to get back to playing guitar, at least when I play guitar, like it's a stress relief, you know? And, uh, and then all of a sudden I just had this thought, I'm like, well, wait a minute. I had so many guitars with figured wood. Why don't I research the wood business? My dad's, you know, I'm in sales. I know how to cut trees, wood. My father's a woodworker. My wife's in marketing. It just made way too much sense. So I didn't think much of it and I ultimately acted on it. And, um, and what I quickly realized was the industry was full of suppliers who I'll just be honest, I won't name names, but they, there's a lot of people out there looking to take advantage of people willing to take their money and not give them the product. They, you know, the customer thinks they're getting the service they deserve. And man, if you, you know, being in the food industry, it was so cutthroat. I said, man, if I can make it in food, I can make it in the wood business. Um, but anyways, people thought I was crazy. Oh, my whole family, my father, my wife, they, they thought I was on my mind. And then when I told my wife, I had to drop a hundred thousand dollars to get into the business, then she almost killed me. <laughs> so I made it work, uh, 90, hundred hour weeks. Uh, I still work those hours, but I have not lost my passion. I love what I do. Uh, I fly out coast to coast. I go up to Canada. We, you know, as a hardwood supplier, we're primarily a maple supplier, but we do have other exotic woods. Um, and we're making some pretty serious and kind of exciting changes that, right now, which I'll get into a little bit later. But um, that's pretty much how we started, Connor. It's, it's, um, it was a long shot. It was hard. It was, I got two little girls. So it wasn't like uh, this thing come. Uh, easy. It was tough, you know, but we're, mm -hmm. we're still plugging away and we're doing good. So awesome. Yeah. And for those that don't know, um, Derek Kimball's Kimball hardwoods. I mean, that's where we get all of our high end maple, super high grade stuff. Um, and 
you know, we know that buying even a 3A top from these guys is going to be some of the highest quality stuff, you know, we found with any maple supplier we work with. Um, so we'll, I guess before we get into grading and stuff, what is flame? What is figure and how does it come about? Yeah, so figure is uh, caused for two reasons, two primary reasons, of which one we know a lot about and the second we don't. So what we know a lot of is what's called compression figure. So if you ever looked at a tree, well, first of all, figure in trees is rare, very rare. And the number one most common type of figure is called compression, and hence the name. It's got lots of uh, weight crushing it. And it distorts the wood grain, but that's usually isolated. So if you have a tree that has a large limb, it's usually located right where the limb meets the trunk of the tree. And uh, I I have gone out countless times where I get calls to cut trees, and because someone thinks you know they've they've won the lottery and they've got a tree full of figure, and I tell them I'm not cutting your tree, and they get really upset. And I'm like, listen, I'm not cutting down a tree for 15. I'm not going to kill a tree for 15 board feet of figure. Mm-hmm. And when you put it in the, for that perspective, people start to, I mean, unless the tree has to come down, but then we'd have to, you know, it, it may not be worth it. Number two figure, the type of figure is what all wood suppliers are after. And that's genetic figure to this day. Nobody knows why, but I can tell you this from cutting trees with figure, uh, genetic figure is that it's, it is what it is. If you see a large a rock curly maple tree and there are offshoot saplings those trees will have figure if mom has figure it is genetic and the other important note with uh genetically figured trees is it's much more abundant and it usually goes far throughout the depth of the tree and in some very rare cases will go all the way through the tree right into the heartwood and um yeah, it's it's what we're all after. But it's a lot of times you don't get that heads up. You know, you don't really know until you cut into the tree. And that's where it gets really risky. You pay good money for a log. You think you know what you have. You cut it open only to realize, you know, 75% of the tree is firewood, which we get free here. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so by a log, um, you know, because you, you're always, listen, I put myself in my customer, the, the you know, either whether the, it's the homeowner or the log, the log buyer, log seller, I get it. They're trying to make a living, but I've also got to make a living too. Be careful. So, so it's a tricky business, man. It really is. Yeah. Um, kind of a side question then, cause I mean, you post and show all the highly figured, the crazy figure, what happens to the bits of the tree that don't have anything in them? So I yeah. guess it's so, 75% of those. Yeah. Well, well, the goal is not to get trees that only have 75% either heartwood, no figure, or, you know, stain, mm-hmm. defect. Um, but we do have outsources. I, you know, so our customers mm-hmm. range, we primarily sell luthiers, um, but we do sell carpenters. We sell turners. We sell jewelry box makers. And we. so we. I have worked really hard. That, that was one of the things I realized going into this business is that the highly figured rare stuff, that was an easy sell. And that's not going to determine my success. The way we're going to be successful is find homes for that stuff that, you know, maybe guys that are building guitars don't want. So um, a lot of what we call furniture grade, you know, wood guy, uh, kind of cabinet guys will take stuff with bug holes in it. All the stuff, you know, that luthiers don't want. You know, the other thing, too, is and I'll just use maple as an example, but maple is the only domestic hardwood here in America, and I think the world actually, that has an actual grading system that was developed about a hundred years ago uh, on the figured side of it. So when it comes to luthier woods, to be considered instrument instrument grade, it's three A grade or higher, and it's a five point scale, A one through five, five being the best. So all that A, you know, one A, two A, three A stuff. Some 3A will go to carpenters, will go to uh, my neighbors, (laughs) will go to, you know, uh, actually one of the biggest problems we have is it it gets dangerous in our shop. If you're not careful, like it literally gets in the way. So, 
it's tough. You know, you you pay the same price for the one, two, three A as you do the five A, and that's the part that a lot of people don't understand. So if you buy wood and it seems a little expensive for five A, it's it's because of the rarity, and we pay a cost average for the mm -hmm. log. Does not matter whether it's got some figure, no figure, hardwood defect does not matter because we can't go. I can't go to a, a log seller and say, hey, I don't I don't like that half of the log. Can you cut it? He'll say, get out of here. So. That's pretty much how that works. Wow. So I guess next, can you kind of take us through the different types of figure? Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So so in terms of just figure in general, okay, not just maple, but but mm -hmm. other species throughout the world, whether it's Africa, South America, mahoganies, and and other exotics, is uh, curl is by far the most dominant or common type of figure. Quilt or quilted pattern is by oh, pretty close to the rarest. And so you have curl figure and maple. Um, you see it in uh, many species, but they tend to be more common, uh, a common trait of specific species like maple here in America. But you'll find it in exotics. Um, it's really preference. You know, some guys swear by flame curly figure. Which, by the way, there's a difference. I don't know if you, your your uh, audience knows that. Yeah, that's what I was just going to ask. Is you know, is there a difference between flamed and curly? Yeah. And yeah, yeah, there actually is. In that, and uh, oh, let's see if I can find you an example. Uh, let's see. Okay, so yep, yeah, I found one. All right, so I'm just gonna I'm. Just, I'm just going to do this block here because you're going to, it'll give you a better idea. So curl, curly maple is a general term. It's the parent term. Think of it that way. It's, it's any wood with curl figure technically, but by, by the rules is curly maple. However, there's actually a difference. Curl figure on the flat sawn side of the board is true curly maple. Curl figure on the quarter side of the board is called flame maple. And in not all cases, but in many cases, the curl figure that's on the flat side of the tree literally looks crinkled like curl, mm -hmm. where the curl on the quartered side tends to be more that pinstripe flame figure. And um, so why don't I do this? I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. And then I'm going to show you a really, uh, something cool. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip flop on you. I'm going to show you the, okay. um, what it looks like inside the tree. And I've got a master grade example of this. And then I'll get into the type of figure and all that. So I'm going to turn this around. All right. So what you're looking at here. Now, this is rough sawn and oxidized. Probably doesn't look that pretty right now. But believe it or not, this is red leaf curly maple. Its botanical is Acer rubrum. And this is a quarter sawn example. And this tree actually, so we're talking about defects and all that. I had a slab that was 15 feet long, 30 inches wide, and two and a half inches thick. It weighed 500 pounds. Wow. And this is this is at the base of the tree. So it mm -hmm. actually flared out, came out here. But at the base of the tree, there was tension, and it fractured the board in the drying process. And it mm -hmm. gave us a really cool insight look into what figure looks like in a master grade curly maple tree. Check this out. Uh, before you pull it, can you show kind of the butt end of the piece so they know what you're talking about? Quarter sawn yeah. versus flat sawn? Yep. So so this, uh, okay. It's really this end, but this end is rough. This mm -hmm. is actually clean. You can see it here. There's your vertical grain, annual tree ring growth, and it is vertical relative to the face. And as you go to the right here, the wood will transition to a horizontal pattern, rift then into flat. So to the right here would be the center heartwood. Mm -hmm. But as you come to the outer edges and you see this, this tapered live edge that was here, bark was here. As you get towards the center of the tree is where you pull your quartered wood. 
Yeah, on a tree. so cordwood wood has those vertical grains on Correct. the end. And if you're looking at the face of it, you'll probably just see a bunch of grain yep. streaks that run down, whereas flat sawn, that would be horizontal, probably somewhat curved. And yep. you'd kind of see that cool looking arch yep. pattern in yep. the face of it. But yeah, anyway, exactly. I'll let you continue. So, yeah, no, no, you're you're absolutely right. So when people say, "Hey, I want vertical grain," that's what they mean. They're looking for these perfect uh, an annual tree ring growth lines that are vertical to the face that that's um, that you're using. So we, in guitars, we use the width or the face. So here's here's inside of the tree, right? For this, so now in a, in a tree that has no figure, it's perfectly flat. And matter of fact, it wouldn't fracture this way. It fractured because it had figure in it. So that's if you insane. see this, that's not a saw mark. That's a fracture line. It was insane. Look at that. It literally has peaks and valleys. And it's, an, it's literally peaks and valleys. And you turn it relative to the light that's shining on it, because curl figure has light sensitivity. It's literally rippled. And this is a fantastic obviously a master grade example of this but look at the look at the, the fibers they literally bent and so if you can imagine a tree that weighs 10 15 thousand pounds this is at the now this is at the bottom mm -hmm. and this is how the grain is like how this tree didn't fall over is a mystery to me and i will tell you i this whole tree was like this all the way through. I mean, literally all the way through the heartwood. It was a once in a lifetime tree. I, so special. I kept it, you know, is a more of a mm -hmm. conversational piece. And you can see where you put the tie in it. Cause it fractured. We had metal straps and they had to keep it, <laughs> spin, which did not work. So, but anyways, that's uh, yeah, look, it's literally bent. Wow. There's one of the fibers there kind of blurry but mm -hmm. oh there it goes yeah so anyways and there it goes back together like it never happened that's incredible yeah isn't that something yeah i, I was i was excited because you, you try to explain that to people and and, it, and it's not their fault that people just look at you with 10 heads like what are these god's earth are you talking about mm -hmm. got a chance to actually show people you know yeah yeah, well, and that's why we wanted to have you on for this first interview, because there's a whole lot of misconceptions in the guitar world, it seems like, especially about flame maple, figured maple, yep. whole nine yards. So hopefully yeah. this is educational to a few. Um, I mean, yep. wood porn to others. <laughs> so can you kind of take us through the different types of maple yeah. that there are, and hard maple versus soft maple, and... Yeah, exactly. So here, in, if, if you're, if whoever's watching this, you're here in America, I'll just, because I'm familiar with it, I'll tell you. Um, here in America, there are just over 130 species of maple, but most of them are transplants, meaning that only 13 of those maple are actually true domestics. Of those 13, we pretty much use three of them. And I'll get into the three and what the applications are and all that. But let's, Let's go back to the beginning. Pilgrim's Land, Plymouth Rock, New England is formed, start building homes, and they know that, they, you know, they came from England, so they didn't have any of this over there. And, and then they know that this, there are trees, they look similar, but man, they are very different. And so that's where the slang terms hard and soft maple came from. They knew one was much harder than the other and heavier, and that's all I knew. And then they figured out you can make maple syrup from one that was harder. And they, so, so as the progression went on, that's a slang term. Unfortunately, it's a term that's misused when you talk in reference to soft maple, which is red leaf maple. So red leaf maple, Acer rub rum, is one of the nicest maples to work with. It's workability. It's hard, but it's not so hard that it drives you crazy. Um, and it's not too soft. It gets a bad rep. People go, it's soft maple. Yes, that's a slang term. It's soft maple, but the wood itself is not soft. It's actually the third hardest of all maples, uh, fourth hardest. And people don't know that. So, um, 
that is also the number one most common maple here in America because it's so versatile. It'll grow in a swamp. It'll grow on a mountainside. It doesn't need uh, well soil that's that has good drainage. Um, so a lot of times people will call it a swamp maple. You know, they really get a bad rep, mm-hmm. but it's but it's. I have be- that block that you just saw is what we call beauty of the burst. It's a slang term for the most beautiful ribbon curl out there. And I will take that any day of the week. I got no problems, no beef with red maple. Now, mm-hmm. hard maple, um, Acer Sarcarum, known as rock maple, eastern hard rock maple, sugar maple, all the same, um, is the snob of the maple trees. It will not grow in a swamp. It will not grow in poor soil conditions. Um, and actually, too, here's a cool little tidbit here in colonial New England. Um, if you're driving Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, and you drive by these old farmhouses that were some of the original homes that were built, you will see 5, 10, 15 of these big old sugar maple, hard maples sitting out front. And we have a term called rock row maple. What that means is the old farmers used to grow the trees once they figured out that you could tap them and make maple syrup. They used to grow them right in front of the original farmhouse. So to this day, 200 years later, plus, you go by and see these trees and you go, that sugar maple, right away you can tell just by seeing them. (laughs) And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, not to get too far off topic here, but a lot of a lot of folks will um, double tap the trees, which which leaves them vulnerable to bug infestation and it kills the tree. Unfortunately, that's what happens. So um, here in New England, a lot of the older trees, they're sick and dying and they have color and bugs and all the stuff that, you know, we guitar guys don't want. So mm-hmm. um, but as far as uh, the uses of that wood, um, rock maple is a great maple for neck construction it's so hard you get it with uh quarter sawn vertical grain makes for great necks um you know back in what i call the gilded age of guitars in the late 50s 60s and even early 70s back when um it was the guitar wars between leo fender and les paul and gibson and um you know it was pretty it was it really was revolutionary some of the stuff that came out of those two decades there where you have uh guys with fantastic ideas that couldn't be more different then you got it hats off to them they they were mm-hmm. just wow. and um with les paul what he figured out was you know love the, the warm sound of mahogany but it's too warm and i got to add some brightness to it and that's where rock maple is uh a truly one of the few red and rock are, are really the two tone woods of the maple family um and so by adding that, obviously, he offset the warmth from the mahogany. Mm-hmm. So now onto the third maple, which is West Coast big leaf maple. I've literally cut these trees. These leaves literally grow 18 inches wide. They're monster trees. They're one of the fastest growing maples, um, Acer macrophyllum. So that, that tree is very unique in the sense that it is a tree that grows in the Pacific Northwest, the best western maple which has flame figure and quilted figure it's very well known for its quilted figure which we sell a lot of um but it the best quilt in the world comes from an area called the olympic peninsula and it's ironically about the size of rhode island the state we're in Mm -hmm. so of that olympic peninsula 50 percent of it's off limits it's on federal land you can't harvest that that wood so a lot of what you see comes from uh on quilted maple and big leaf flame primarily comes from two areas it comes from uh, individual landowners that call an arborist or a tree cutter to come in to take the tree out because they're actually a nuisance. They, they suck up. If you have, as a homeowner on the peninsula, if you have a home, you have a big leaf maple tree there and you're growing shrubs and, and um, you know, flowers and all that, the tree will kill them because it'll drink up all the water and the other, the other plants and vegetation won't grow. So that's why they were primarily taken out. Um, and that's controlled one tree cutter at a time. And then the other uh, outlet for it comes from the cedar, Western Red Cedar uh, logging companies. It just so happens that West Coast Big Leaf Maple grows in tandem with red cedar. So by default, when they do these large cedar cuttings and clearings, they, they also come up with loads of logs. But we, guys like me struggle uh, to connect with the cedar clearing guys because the log buyers and sellers that do that generally ship those off to Asia 
in other parts of the world where I'll give you an example in Korea. The your Korean buyer comes in for a veneer company and will buy a full load. They'll pay top premium dollar for it, knowing that they're going to put the logs in a container and it's going to take a month to get there and all the logs are going to stain. They don't mm-hmm. care because they can bleach the wood. Yeah. We can't bleach the wood here. The chemicals that re- that require that are required to do it, it's illegal to use here. Mm-hmm. So think about it from a buying perspective. You've got a log seller, like a guy on the West Coast who's got, you know, a fifty thousand dollar load of quilted maple logs. Well, he'd much rather deal with the veneer guys in Asia who pay top dollar, who won't complain about stain or anything. And and so guys like me, it's a tough. So I've got a handful of individual tree cutters I deal with. Um, it's also a really tricky business out on that West Coast, man. There's a lot of methamphetamine problems, a lot of drug issues. Mm-hmm. So you have to be very careful who you buy from, um, which is like a full-time job because I've had to fire guys because you hear rumors and you sit there and go, well, I'm 3,000 miles away, man. I, you know, So I just, we do everything on the up and up. We don't cut any corners. We don't buy stolen wood. We don't We don't do, we pull permits. I was just out there in December pulling permits, cutting trees. I personally cut trees out there. Um, Is it a pain? Yeah, but it's the right thing to do. You got to do it the right way. So that's pretty much how it works. Do you want to see some quilt? Oh, hell yeah. All right. So check this out. I'm going to show your viewers what it looks like when we take the bark off the tree. So I always keep, these are called buck skin cutoffs that's a slang term and a key indicator is when we rip the bark off you see that Mm -hmm. jack that's the jackpot right there oh man yeah so you name it man we got all different ones here you know long all all different figure patterns i'm gonna get into that in a second here but it's all different stuff and it's literally quilt bubbles all the way through, all the way up. Now, check this out. You ready? I was ready for you. So here, yeah, here's... Nice joiner, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish, I wish they were cheap. So it, here's your quilt bubbles, right? So the bark's right here. You, you debark the tree. You got to do it carefully, too, because you kill the tree. And then, you know. Damn. Oh, yeah. It gets better. Hold on. All right. So that's sawn and oxidized. And when we clean it up on this mm-hmm. joiner, that's what it looks like. And like they're so silver. cool. Yeah. The cool part is with quilt, there's, there's, God, it seems like there's, here's tube quilt. There's like unlimited options for patterns. Mm-hmm. Wow. Isn't that something? That's amazing. Oh, yeah, it just gets better and better. You, you know, I I keep these. I, I hoard these. This is one of the yeah, few. I don't co- blame you there. So when you clean that up, it's, mm-hmm. it's spectacular. So, I mean, one last one. And then I'll get into. Yeah, it's all two. So if you check this out, right. I want to show you viewers. So you remember the video, uh, the, what I showed you on the, um, the curly, right? Mm hmm. This is where quilt is so different. It goes from completely vertical, which is the outer ring portion of the quilt. It literally goes vertical and mm-hmm. then instantaneously goes straight down, goes horizontal, and then comes right back up. And it's an absolute distortion of wood grain. I mean, I mean, look at the, well, if that doesn't tell you what's going on inside the tree, it's crazy. It changes directions, depth. Mm-hmm. And um, those trees are massive. So to find to find a tree with that figure and it's still standing, that that to me probably blows my mind the most. Oh you yeah. Sit at the bottom, and those trees weigh twenty thousand pounds. And you sit there, and go, how did this thing fall over in a storm? Like it just they don't, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's quilt. Wow. So those are the three. Those are the three primary luthier style maples. They, we, there's definitely some stuff out there, like out in um, Europe. We we do have another one here too. It's a Norway maple in the mm-hmm. northeast, but it was uh, it's it was imported here. But it's common 
over in um, Eastern European states, that's what they use. It's very, very similar to red leaf, like almost identical. And um, and so and then English sycamore, which is not really it's of the Acer family. It's called Acer, actually, mm-hmm. uh, but it's not a true, true maple, but it looks very similar. So kind of in the same areas, the different kinds of maple, um, you'd mentioned that you go out and cut the trees and do a lot of the permit work and stuff. Um, I guess, is there a lot of danger in cutting these trees? Are they endangered at all? Um, what's the, well, what's the word that, uh, I think the well, the one saving grace with the West Coast maple, uh, the East Coast maple, no, much more common. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's in a uh, common strictly for the the reason that the geographical area in which they grow is pr- pretty pretty big. Um, still rare when you find stuff, but on the West Coast it's a different deal. So you have you have two things at play here. Um, you would think so, thinking how small the geographical area is. But a lot of it, these, the tree grow, number one, it grows really, really fast. It goes from a sapling to a mature tree within 40 years, which is impressive. Yeah. That's, you know, it goes, it goes from a knee high sapling to a hundred, 110 feet, four feet in diameter and weighs, you know, 15, 20,000 pounds. I mean, that, that's pretty epic. I mean, I turned 40 last week. So it'd be like me being born and now being 120 feet tall. And it's crazy. So, Mm -hmm. That helps, but it doesn't change the fact that it is still a small geographical footprint. To make matters worse, is there's a lot of theft going on because the wood's so uh, rare and expensive, uh, and there just happens to be a very big. Uh, the Pacific Northwest was pretty much where methamphetamine first showed its ugly face here in the United States. So they had to jump on everybody else, mm-hmm. and, and I have been out there, guys. These towns, when I say blue collar, at six o'clock, everything's shut down. There's nothing to do out there. So these guys party, do drugs. Well, anyways, um, yeah, people go out on the federal land and cut. And they, so you just got you to be really careful who you deal with. Um, listen, my deal is if you can't show papers, I don't buy it. Mm-hmm. Is that, have I gotten offers for insane wood? Absolutely. No papers, I don't buy it. If I can't pull the permits on it, I don't cut it. You know, so and the other thing, too, is we we're doing now is when I go out there, I'm doing less and less cutting, by the way. So we're, what I'm finding is that my I'm apps, my time is best spent here in the warehouse. We've actually got two shops. This is the biggest of the two. But um, my time is better spent here. And mm-hmm. when I go out there, it's just it's it's nuts. You know, you, you don't know who you're dealing with half the time. So you just you, you stick to what you know and. It's a slow process when I, to bring somebody new on, there's a lot that goes into it. I'll just go, Hey, yeah, I'll buy your wood from you. That's all I, I don't, I don't need bad press. We do things the right way. We pay for stuff. We don't, you know, we don't, we cooperate with the government, the USDA with Santa wood sanitation and all that stuff. We have a relationship with the government. We're not looking to have the feds at our doorstep saying, what are you doing? You know? So anyways, but thanks. Well, I guess kind of switching gears here, um, wood drying. So do you kiln dry it, air dry it? What's the difference? How does yep. that all work? Yeah, so both. Um, but ideally, in a uh, best case scenario, is we kiln dry it, which is the air drying process just artificially sped up. Mm-hmm. So, which is so a process. Back for a second, what does drying actually do to the wood? Well, it shrinks the cellular structure, and depending on what the, the wood species is, that percentage, it's very minimal. So maple is 3 to 5%. So it's very small. But, but wood in general has a lot of water, a lot of moisture. And guys like me are always freaked out because we buy logs, we cut boards. We want them to, to get dry, but you have to control the rate in which water comes out of the wood. And if you don't do this the right way and it comes out too fast, it splits. And in many cases, especially in the guitar parts business, if wood splits, it's rendered useless in a lot of cases. So you have to be really, really careful. And there's a few ways um, that we do it. And depending on what 
species is it needs to actually be handled um, in a different way. So a lot of times we'll, we'll use, like I'll just use maple because we're obviously do a lot of it. Um, we will leave the wood unsealed on the end grain just for seven to 10 days, but we're watching it every day because what we want is to shed, you know, 10% of its moisture. And then we have to quickly seal the ends and we use um, a product called anchor seal, which is a semi-permeable paint wax, which allows the wood to breathe, draw the water out, but slow the rate in which it comes out. So the wood doesn't split. And that's in the best case scenario. So of course, mm-hmm. wood ultimately does whatever the heck it wants. Yep. So that, that's pretty much it as far as the kiln drying process. Um, it's just something that uh, one really, really important uh, note, more so with quilted big leaf maple. Um, one of the reasons why it can be expensive, other than the cost of it, the rarity, the issues, the headaches, um, and then actually here on the East Coast, transportation, you know, is a big uh, factor too. Uh, just a weird sidebar note that I bought a truckload of quilted maple blocks back in December and it, and it literally cost me $8,000 to transport it back to the East. <laughs> so it's like, it's so mad. That's just the transport, mm-hmm. right? Not all the risk, not everything else, all the cash you got to put up for it and all that. Um, but one of the really, really important things, like, so if, if you're going to get, you know, any of your followers going to start deciding to cut some wood or get wood from a local company or a tree cutter, what you got to be careful for is you have to bring the moisture down past its critical uh, percentage. You cut a tree, it could be 60, 70% moisture. You got to get it down to about 25% before what we call it kiln safe. If you a lot of wood, if that's two, three inches thick, if you just take it, cut the tree, seal the ends and throw it on sticks in the, in the kiln, chances are the wood's going to stain. It's going to split. And it's going to honeycomb or fibrous tears explode right from the center. It's too much water. You're asking it to do too much too fast. So you have, to, that's why we do partial air drying first. Then we put it in the kiln. So that is kiln drying. And plus there's, there's, a, look, we're actually in the next year, I'm committed to buying a vacutherm kiln. So if you guys ever want to look what that is, that, that is a zero oxygen full contact uh kiln that goes up like 175 degrees they're super expensive they're insanely efficient and now because oxygen's the killer that's what a lot of people don't realize the second oxygen hits wood and it's in the kiln it wood stains it splits Mm -hmm. but if you take all the oxygen out of that process it is zero vacuum so you take Think about zero, uh, zero oxygen. You, you you now can heat the wood to 90 degrees at a lower altitude because there's zero oxygen. It's all about vacuum and pressure. So anyways, not to get too far off on kiln drying, but air drying is not something we look to do uh, because the idea is not to sit on millions of dollars worth of wood indefinitely. Um, mm-hmm. We've got to sell it. But... We do, we buy our brains out and occasionally we buy wood and it just, it's a wood that, that we've had for a while up on sticks and we just never got around to it. And we said, oh, the heck with it. We just leave it. And that's pretty much air drying as far as the guitar parts business. A lot of the slab providers out there will air dry wood because at the rate in which they're cutting slabs and the space that it takes up and the cost that it of running these big kilns and they're in no rush to sell it, then you'll see guys put it up on large sticks in full slab form and let it dry. And in many cases, whether it's two, three inches thick, it could be two, three years before mm-hmm. you get that. And the other thing too, is in the it, two, two really important parts to understand about um, air dried wood. So, if you air dry wood, depending on what part of the country you're located in, that wood's EMC or equilibrium moisture content, which is basically the average air dried moisture content that that wood is happy, it ranges. But you might be in the Pacific Northwest and that number is 18 to 20 percent. Well, if you're a luthier, that's a problem because mm-hmm. you're going to be cutting wood down to a quarter of an inch. You're not going to want your wood 20 percent. So depending on what the application mm-hmm. is, you have to be careful. Um, but then you have long-term 
uh, air dried status. And I have some wood. I'm going to show you right now that I bought from a private collection. And I've got 500 of these. And these all have, now this is, this is big leaf flame maple. You look at the side grain. Look at that. Mm -hmm. all figure. But check this out. There's dates on every single one. And that goes back to two, to the day it was dried in 2007. So that piece of wood is 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with this wood is a really cool thing that happens if you literally sit on it, not for two, three years, but 10, 13, 15, 20 years, which a lot of this wood has been. And what happens is it, it's like um, it's like a broken in vehicle after a while with all the ups and downs of the, the weather, the temperatures, the moistures. After a while, the wood's like, eh, I'm used to it. No big deal. And it doesn't move. It stays flat as can be. This stuff is just flat packed. It's not wrapped. It's just stacked. Mm -hmm. it I mean, you know, we're looking at some day. Here you go. 2003. You know, 17 years old. It's you like know, Willy Wonka's chocolate factory in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's, well, I got to, you know, it's also stressful too, man. You got to get rid of it and sell it. So, mm -hmm. but anyways, um, wow. You keep it indefinitely for a long time. And honestly, it's, it, it gets more and more stable. One of the things I'm really going to ex explain though, see if I can get my hands on one here without getting killed. Hold on. Let me get up here. Yeah, here we go. All right, so I'm going to bring this over here. And if you look at this, what happens over time is it gets what it's called an oxidized patina. So oxygen is the catalyst, which brings the sugar and minerals to the surface. Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing as perfectly dry wood. No such thing. You'd have six, which is super low, eight, 10, 12. There's always some form of moisture in wood. But the cool part about long-term air-dried wood is it creates this shell. It's like a it, it dulls. The wood dulls, changes slightly, changes color, and it creates a barrier. So it becomes impervious. It, it actually protects the wood from rapid change because wood doesn't like rapid change, doesn't like going from 30 to 70% Humidity doesn't like doing the opposite, going from 70 to 30. It shows its ugly face in the form of wood movement when that happens. But this wood, unlike this wood, is air dried a long time and has a nice shell on it, we say. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I take this and hit, hit it with a joiner, it'll turn bright, bright white. But important to note, anytime you touch surface, saw, sand, plane, joint, wood, the wood needs to reacclimate because you've now opened the grain and now it's <laughs> going to breathe. It's going to go, Oh, I'm free. You know, suck up all the moisture or lack thereof. It'll suck the moisture out of the wood. And that's really, really important that people know that. Um, I know, I know it's, I get it. I used to buy stuff and I used to love to rip it out of the package mm -hmm. and show buddies, but, the, but you do have to be careful because you can take something that was really cool and ruin it. Um, Wood really does need time. Like, so if you buy something from me, right, and mm -hmm. I ship it, think about it. It's been wrapped, put in a package, thrown in a truck, in a back room, thrown on a plane, off a plane, in and off. I mean, it's just the wood just goes, what, what are you doing to me? You know, so when it shows up, you really do have to give it time to acclimate. And so let me show you and your audience um, really how to handle wood, because this is one of the things that, that I still don't understand. Uh, I see so many luthiers out there stickering wood because mm -hmm. they probably saw that Paul Reed Smith video. And I, and I bang my head against the wall every time I see that. And I'm like, no, that is not what you do. Anytime wood is dry, don't sticker it ever. You're just encouraging wood movement. Will it acclimate? Sure. But the problem is if you're the, the wood that you're stickering, your tolerance is close to your minimum spec, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. It's going to move. Yeah. Here's, here's a way to do it. Wrap it. 
flat reference surface to flat reference surface, wrap it in plastic wrap. Make sure it's absolutely tight as can be. That wood's not going anywhere. Check this out. Same thing with tops. I'm not doing this for my health. I do this because it keeps them flat. I use particle, reinforced particle board on the top, on the bottom, and then I wrap it. Mm -hmm. that, they never move. And the end grain is exposed. It takes longer, but the wood will acclimate. Remember, the wood is dry. You don't need to throw it up on sticks. Not you, but anyone. You don't need to yeah, throw yeah. it on sticks. It's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. It just takes a little bit longer to draw, uh, to uh, to acclimate when you when you move it. So literally, this is this is rock maple necks, and I bind them together as long as they're flat. That's the key. The key with wood is wood will do what you ask it to, but you got to make sure that whatever you're referencing the wood to is a term we use called flat referencing. Mm -hmm. that is the me binding two necks together wrapping them tight they'll stay flat but if this bottom board is warped this straight board is going to become warped it's like it's like that old adage our parents used to tell us well you might be a good kid but if you hang out with the wrong crowd eventually you're going to be a bad dude the same thing happens with wood mm -hmm. you got a flat piece of wood and you and you put it on a table i've seen guys do uh take wood and flat stack it pack it on their table to only find out that their table's out of parallel <laughs> it's the wood's going to get warped it happens mm -hmm. so, so leave yourself some number one leave yourself some room so if because chances are probably move a little bit yep and have and and i think one of the bigger challenges i i find in, in the luthier world maybe maybe with the beginners is have the right equipment mm -hmm. i know it's expensive but it makes a world of difference and you can get pretty creative you don't have to buy you know seven thousand dollar joiner you can uh, make a router sled. You can buy a bench top. If you're doing neck planks, buy a, you know a five six inch six inch uh, bench top model. As long as it's yeah. in parallel, that's the key. You you can get your wood straight again. You know you can't. If you got a bow or warp in wood, you can't drum sand or plane your way to flatness. That's what mm -hmm. I tell. You. you need a new flat reference, and that's what a joiner is for, or a router sled. Or you have to start with something flat to ask the other side of the wood because it's compounded. If you have a bow or a warp on one side, you, you have the opposite reaction on the other side of the wood. Mm -hmm. So that's that. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and shoot, we just switched out our planer head with one of those spirals, like yep. the spiral, you know, and you have the blades that have four sides Yep. and shoot that cuts through, you know, those hard figured maple tops. Like it's nothing. We used to not run our tops through the, planer yeah just like that we just not run any tops through the planer anything figured because it would just splinter it out chip it out but well we do i do a lot with uh, a massive amount of planing joining as you can imagine we actually don't sand a lot of people don't know that we don't sand hmm. because it would never get the job done there yeah we sell thousands of items and a lot of guys so so i make tasteful changes so so i i told, i made a decision we're not going to sand i'll get back into the planing part in a second here I made the decision that we're not going to sand. But what I also made the decision was that on my 16 inch digital horizontal resaw, we're going to use $400 Lennox carbide tooth, three, four tooth per inch blades that give a super clean uh, cut to mm -hmm. the point where you, you got to look close. You can't see it. So that was my compromise. So as far as planing, you have to be careful. You're right. That remember wood uh, figure is a distortion of the grain. So then add every other characteristic of the wood, and it's all about the depth of cut. You have to be careful. The grain orientation, uh, probably the the most difficult maple to to work with is big leaf. It's so ferrous, very fibrous because mm -hmm. it grows strand. The wood grain strands are so big, then and, and with quilt it literally goes vertical. And a lot of guys actually, it's funny. A lot of guys will say, "Hey, this tear out in the set." And it's like it's not tear out. I, I'm sorry to, but it's, it's, it's not tear out. It's, it's actually, it's called furring. It's almost unavoidable. The only way to, to, and we do do this on the higher grade sets is after we spiral plane them, we'll actually hit them with high speed steel, but you need, we, sh you need super sharp blades. You could take five passes and then all of a sudden you've got a, a planer line mm -hmm. and I'll get messages too. What's that line? <laughs> it's like, well, get a little nick in the blade and, and that's what happens. But it's you sand it out, it'll come right out. Yeah. And uh, you know, and the other thing too uh, for everyone to know, if you've ever seen a set that 
that's high speed steel. It's like glassy, super, super shiny and slippery. Mm-hmm. It's important that everyone understands if you ever want to know what the wood's going to look like at about a thousand grit, that's, that's the equivalent to about a thousand grit. Wow. Yeah. Maybe that's just a tick over. Maybe like, thing that far. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've done the test and, and about 12, 1,000 to 1,200 grit. Mm-hmm. And a lot of guys will tell you that you, that you can only go to 250 and sending. That's tr- That's simply not true. You can go higher. The, the key to sanding, and you know this, you're with you, is as you sand up, you've got to discard the larger rocks from the sandpaper. It's 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 vital because what happens is as you now take a, a higher grit or a smaller rocks sandpaper, if you don't get rid of the small rocks from the lower grit, you actually dull the wood mm-hmm. when you sand. And we've yeah. had a lot of people message us about that. I said, you, you got to make sure it's so important that you clean up that wood real nice in between uh, sanding. Mm-hmm. You know? so, yeah, well, we spend just as much time spraying out the paper, spraying out the piece as we do sanding it. Because, yeah, I mean, yeah. one, one piece of dust, especially, you know, when we're sanding the finish, sanding the lacquer flat, you know, uh-huh. you get oh, yeah. a wrong piece of dust and you drag a lacquer turd through that. So you got another day of spraying t- time to it's time to do it's a do over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So just some helpful t- tips, you know. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I guess so the last question I had is, um, I guess, can you debunk some common myths about curly maple? I know you've done a little bit of it, you know, don't sticker dried yep. wood and things like that. Is there anything else you can think of misconceptions? Yeah. Of- there's some all right. So if you ever get into the, some of the purists out there, I call them a purist. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the guys that never seem to have enough. They have more time than anyone else on forums, right? And they, I'm gonna and say the, it's forum dudes. Yeah, exactly. That they, they have nothing but time. You know, mm-hmm. they'll tell you, oh, only air dried wood, not kiln dry. To take it becomes lackluster, and that's crap. I'm sorry. You you can kiln dry wood. And I mean, maybe it could be argued for woods with warmer, richer colors, you know, walnuts and all that. I have yet to see it, uh, but I'm. But when it comes to maple and all that, there's so so many naysayers out there. Just treat it right. Just handle it correctly, because even when you do that, there's no guarantees. Mm-hmm. You know, woods uh, temperamental, man. It just it just does whatever it wants, you know. So, and every wood's different. Not every wood's the same. This is Arctic, Arctic birch. birch. Birch, yeah. Yeah, it's a flame birch. This is a this is a one percenter right here, you know. And it's, every wood underneath is curly maple ambrosia master grade mm-hmm. with with streaks. And so every wood's got different different colors, different tones, different reactions. Um, but as far as myths, there aren't too many, you know. Uh, just know that, you know, that knowing where the stuff comes from, uh, how rare it is, understanding that rarity, where it comes from now, knowing, now, you know, why in some cases very expensive. Um, that's pretty much it, you know? Okay. So what's, what's next for Kimball Hardwoods? Where are you going from here? Yeah. So I'm going to take you on a quick little tour. You'll be the first one to see this. So I broke the wall down. And, um, so we're getting into the bodywood business. So I got, well, it's over here. I got hard maple and all kinds of figured stuff, rainbow poplar, all kinds of stuff over here, but the same over here, carb tops, got 50 of those going on. We got all kinds of curly wood here, but we're getting into, to, to bodywood. So we have on the other side over here, I have swamp ash. We have true hunter mahogany wild uh grown wild we bought a, a guy 10 years ago on private property um this here is african with a yellow is african mahogany mm-hmm. sapili alder um more curly maple so we're setting up here i got a 12 foot blue jig coming in here setting up chop saws uh that's some bird's eye maple down there about 500 feet uh basswood and i got um yeah there's a matter of fact there's the blue jig thing's a beast weighs 1700 pounds has fit has um 
30 52 inch clamps and it's a rack sh system it's from jlt you guys should check it out i mean they're just what a great product so but we'll set up the whole station there um and this and i've got more wood coming tomorrow all next week and so we're getting into the body wood business and um we'll be gluing up blanks uh other thing too is i thought being the sales guy that i am we're we're uh, finally got approved and because uh, it's a process and not everyone gets it uh, approved but we're uh, officially going to be a tight bond glue distributor nice yeah, so, so I just figured if we're going to be using that much glue, why, why wouldn't I sell it? My, my customers are buying it. Heck yeah. So you're going to see us get into doing body kits. And I think one of the things I'm going to do that's going to be a little bit different than what you see out there is I want to offer three kits, good, better, best. And uh, all the way from the fingerboard, neck blank, body, body wood, top, and eight ounces of glue and, a, you know, a few other little knickknacks. Um I see kits out there, but it seems like maybe some suppliers are trying to get rid of some of their wood. I mean, I hate to say it that way. So we'll have the, you know, price conscious entry level builder uh, kit like everyone else does. But we'll have something that will be more money, but within, you know, affordable. And then we'll have the eye candy master grade. Holy crap. Where did you get that kind of guitar kit? Mm -hmm. You know, because what I found is. The, the more figure wood has, the more complicated it gets. Yeah. The decision-making process. You sit there. I've, I've done it all the time. I had nine guitars built for me this year. And what you think was the easy part turns out to be the hard part. I, hey, I found the wood. It's beautiful. Oh, crap. What color? What, you know, what goes? Oh, man. You, know, you start talking yourself in and out of it 15 different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but one of the things I'm actually pretty good at putting colors together um so we'll we'll see we'll see how it goes but that's some of the new stuff i mean a lot of people don't realize in order doesn't look like much but the financial commitment to get into that portion of the business oh, <laughs> i was gonna mahogany. say just that stack of african mahogany is oh yeah that's one. that's one of i got three i got uh a full truckload coming mm -hmm. in addition to that and Honduran and all of that yep. Yep. swamp ash Oh yeah, I got that all. It's it's before you know it, you're into it for 150 thousand without blinking an eye, selling a piece of a single stick of wood, mm -hmm. and you go, oh, man, I hope they show up. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, especially now. I think the biggest challenge is one of the things that I I I promised that I wouldn't give into the fear with the COVID 19 and all this stuff going on in the world. I think people want to go in the shop in the garage. They want to build. I think they want to still use their luthier and have a guitar built. And I refuse to lay down and die. We're going mm -hmm. to grow. So I, you know, it just I'm going to do the do the best we can. Hope everyone stays safe. And uh, that's pretty much it. We just keep working, plugging away. Hell yeah! So that's Derek Kimball, obviously one of the hardest working guys in the industry. Great, great tone wood. Check out their Instagram at. Kimball Hardwoods, correct? Yep. And eBay, Kimball Hardwoods. Um, oh, one other note. I uh, I didn't, this, you asked what was happening. Speaking of spending a fortune. So I, um, I have not been happy with our website. Uh, we, you know, it's kind of frustrating because we, we send a lot of people to eBay. We understand a lot of people don't want to go on eBay. They don't want to use that, that system. Mm -hmm. We are pretty far along in a new uh, website unveiling. It was very expensive, very time consuming. It's going to be a whole new platform. It's going to be user friendly. There's going to be videos on it. It's going to be pretty killer. And uh, a lot of thought went into this. So we're rebranding the logo, everything, and the new website. So I'm hoping the next two or so months, it, it, uh, it'll be available. And it's going to be so much better than going to eBay. No offense to eBay. I'm grateful for the opportunity to meet mm -hmm. new people, but I just think they're thieves. And, uh, you yeah, know, it'd be nice to be able to happen. I think the big thing is to op have an open dialogue with customers, right? Customer comes in and has a question. Yeah, I'll absolutely. Really, and, and send them to a video or, you know, that, that was one of the things that I, that I promised that I would always be an accessible owner operator of my business. Mm -hmm. too, many, too many stiffs out there that refuse to return an email or phone call or a message for someone yeah. who's starting out who could really use the advice. 
So I said, no, I'm doing this to help people. Yeah, I'm doing this to make money and grow the business and so my family, but I'm not going to be that guy in the back room that refuses to come talk to somebody. No way. That's not me. Well, anyway, well, thank you very much for your time Thanks. and being on with us. And I'd love to do this again sometime. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, definitely be uh, getting back with you and talking soon. All right. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked that video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button and check out our channel for more guitar related content.